so this is actually the first time that we are um, discussing this topic at the ICNC Summer Institute. So you all are pioneers with me. Um, I would like to start uh, by um, just saying a few words about um, the outline of the presentation so you can see where we're going with this. Um, first of all, I'll discuss the aims of the presentation. Um, I'll share a few ideas for framing our discussion. Um, then I will look briefly at three case studies. Um, these case studies are of actually different um, levels. One case study will be of an individual who is involved in diaspora. One uh, case study will be uh, a, an NGO that's a diaspora NGO. And the last one is uh, a diaspora itself more broadly. And then uh, Michele will be giving a, a 10 minute presentation about the Ethio Ethiopian diaspora, followed by Daniel talking about the Ugandan diaspora. And we're going to revisit some of the questions that you just write down at the very end. Um, hopefully we'll have about 20 minutes at the very end to talk about these questions. So the aims of the presentation, these are also kind of disclaimers, is like I said, this is the first time that we're um, including this topic at uh, the Institute. And it's very much an exploratory session. I don't pretend to be any sort of expert on the topic. Um, I have been a migrant myself, but I am not involved in uh, diaspora organizations myself. I think some of you are, or uh, are um, activists who are also reaching out to diasporas. So I think in the room we have a lot of different types of uh, points of view, and I want to capitalize on that, um, which is the second aim of the presentation, which is to uh, engage in peer learning um, at the end, uh, especially when we'll have our discussion. Um, and uh, we will be engaging both on the analytical and the practical levels. Um, I feel as though this topic is very much an underexplored um, topic and that it's also very much a timely one um, with refugee movements and um, in the Middle East as well as Europe um, and also kind of a, recognize, a, a, a growing recognition of diasporas as a uh, global actor, not only in civil resistance but also in international development, um, in the economy uh, and beyond. So we are going to explore the subject together. A few thoughts. Um, so thank you for writing down your definitions of diaspora. I wanted to share a collective definition of this term. Um, I think it's important in the sense that uh, language is built by the people who use it. And it's especially important for the concept of diaspora, I believe, because it's, uh, it's a concept that I think has evolved over the years. So um, I was just going to read through a few of these for you all. Um, diaspora, this is a process whereby community members from one continent or a country spread across other continents or countries. Diaspora is a category of persons that left their country. It refers to Jewish diasporas who fled from their country of origins due to loss of territory. Diasporas, uh, all citizens leaving abroad having one direct connections and two direct interests, um, business, politics, human rights. Next, we have diaspora is the dispersion of a nation around different parts of the world. Diasporas are people living in a foreign country, land or country, it says. And uh, two last definitions, diaspora is the word for a certain amount of population of a given country living in another country or in other countries. Diaspora people are either lonely or united or divided. I like that. <laughs> and finally, uh, diaspora refers to an individual or group of individuals who have left their home country and reside in another country. So my takeaways from your definitions are, one, that there is a migration that takes place. There's a migration story. Um, another takeaway I have from these is that um, they're lonely, united, or divided, so that, um, that kind of speaks to their diversity um, and their, uh, their, the fact that they're in different stages, um, personally and politically uh, and socially. Um, and uh, one last takeaway I thought was very interesting um, is, oh, let's see, is, um, is that 
people are no longer at their, in their home country or their origin country. They're in a new home country or adoptive country. Um, thank you very much then for sharing those. So since this is an exploratory session, I wanted to bring you along my uh, curiosity journey um, to being interested in this subject. And these are some of the guiding questions that I've been keeping in mind and that I'd love for you to keep in mind as we go through the session. Um, can diasporas be understood as external actors? So I'm challenging, I guess, uh, a notion that we talked about yesterday during the external actors session. Um, I'd like for us to think throughout this session, are um, our diasporas, can they best be understood as external actors or something else? Why do many diasporas engage in similar but civil resistance activities? I think this question is important um, to, you know, to put forth because um, I want to know exactly so why do, what is it about being a diaspora that makes them engage in, um, in activities that are often um, you know, related to funding or um, fundraising and things like that. It seems as though many diasporas engage in similar activities, so I want to know why. Um, what are the processes or mechanisms by which um, diasporas bring about change? What I mean by that, it's kind of jargon, um, but what I mean by that is point A, point B. So point A is diaspora organization, point B is social change or political change or whatever change that they are aiming to make. So what is it that gets them from point A to point B? And lastly, how can the civil resistance framework inform our understanding of diasporas as global actors? So again, how can uh, talking about civil resistance and diasporas engagement in civil resistance help us better understand um, diasporas and complete our understanding of their agency, basically? The state of affairs. Um, we could go on forever about the state of affairs of, um, you know, in political, uh, academic, and media circles. Um, seems like everyone has an opinion on migration and refugees and all that sort of thing. It's a very political topic. Um, but two that I want to sort of state of affairs that I'd like to share with you for the purpose of this um, presentation is that um, it seems as though in these different circles, when we talk about diasporas, the focus is really on their economic agency. And uh, that's also kind of linking back to our guiding question of, um, of uh, you know, how civil resistance can help us understand them, uh, fully understand their agency beyond just uh, economic agency. Um, and then political opportunity structure. I came across this uh, sort of wonky term uh, in a couple of studies uh, that focused on diaspora actors. One was on, um, Syri I'm sorry, yes, um, sorry, Tunisian, um, a Tunisian movement that was based in Germany. And the concept of political opportunity structure is basically that uh, diasporas are limited in their activities uh, and that they're, they basically are powerless over the types of activities that they can engage in. And I want to challenge this notion um, in our session today. Um, one of the things that uh, Peter Ackerman spoke about on Tuesday was um, agency, and structure or conditions and skills. And um, I want to explore the notion that diasporas are limited by their conditions. I want to explore that. And I want to look at how, um, how we can kind of explode that and blow that up and really look at uh, their agency beyond just their, um, the structures that they're limited by. My arguments. So, I believe that diasporas are unique actors. Um, I think we can think about them in terms of external actors in some ways, but uh, I also think it's um, useful to think of them as transnational actors, and we'll talk about that. Um, they are on the inside and the out. They're also a bridge sometimes between activists in, um, in uh, origin countries and external actors. So in some ways, I feel as though they do operate as external actors, but they also um, operate as movement actors themselves, as well as transnational actors. <laughs> so they live transnational lives, and they operate in transnational spaces. What I mean by transnational is two different things. One, they live in two different places at the same time, or they live in no country mentally or in their, uh, in their activities at the same time. 
So they're kind of neither here nor there, and yet everywhere at the same time. Um, transnational, I also want to point out this migration story. I think this, this is an important point that sets them apart from external actors, is that diaspora actors, um, they, they live a migration story. They're torn between two countries. Or perhaps they're not. Perhaps they're totally over leaving their origin country. But in many ways, they're still having, uh, being called on uh, to relate back to that country. And then uh, two last arguments um, that I would put forth are really that what distinguishes them from many other different types of uh, external actors is that uh, diasporas share a common identity and values with uh, movement actors in origin countries. So I think um, this is actually related to the last point. So they're, they're fluid, dynamic, and diverse groups. So tying those two together, um, we, I would say that um, external actors are oftentimes organizations or groups or governments that have a fixed budget, that have a mission, and that generally doesn't change drastically over the course of a year. And uh, so as opposed to that, in contrast to that, diaspora groups um, are fluid and always uh, often changing because they're stuck in this transnational space. Um, and they are not homogenous. They're not, um, they're not made up of people of exactly the same ethnicities, cultures, religions, etc. This kind of sets them apart from you know, governments or other NGOs that, are, um, that have these fixed budgets and that have predictability. Diaspora groups oftentimes are unpredictable or uh, are, um, are made up of different groups. So I think that's very much different. So running through these very briefly, because I want to give more time to uh, Michaela and Daniel to talk in depth about theirs. But uh, I just wanted to point out one uh, organization, uh, diaspora organization, which is um, uh, based in DC. And it's a Nigerian uh, diaspora organization called Act for Accountability. I recently spoke with the uh, executive director, um, uh, Omolala uh, Adele Oko. And uh, so one thing that I wanted to highlight very briefly about the Nigerian um, NGO is um, one, one very much you know, takeaway from this interview was that they, they share the same values as the movement actors in Nigeria. So they formed uh, in reaction to uh, the kidnapping of the girls in um, in Nigeria by Boko Haram, and uh, the woman with whom I spoke uh, called up the Nigerian embassy when she found out that uh, these girls were missing and she wanted answers, and they didn't have any answers. And um, so she demanded answers, and uh, she began this organization which engages mostly in um, information dissemination. They engage in direct actions. We have a couple of photos actually of marches in DC, um, uh, this also shows uh, a person who is um, supposedly not from Nigeria, I don't have confirmation, but um, she said that oftentimes they have non-Nigerian um, people who join their marches. Um, and uh, they also engage in information dissemination and framing, media messaging, to get the word out that uh, there is no government accountability and that uh, there needs to be something to, to, to be done about it. So this is, um, this is an article that uh, Omolala Adel Oso wrote uh, to, to do so, to share you know, information. For the Iranian diaspora, this is uh, the case study about an individual um, whose name is Mohsen Sazagara, who uh, is actually um, engaged, uh, was mostly engaged actually over many decades um, with, uh, with, um, with a movement in uh, Iran towards um, fair, free and fair elections. And uh, I want to talk very briefly about his uh, engagement, his personal, individual engagement in the Green Revolution or the Green Movement. Um, he's based in Washington, and he films 10-minute uh, videos every night uh, of civil resistance information that he wants to broadcast back to Iran. And there's millions of people who uh, have um, who have broadcast television, satellite television, in Iran, which is difficult for the regime to control. And so he's able to, uh, to not only engage over the internet and social media to share knowledge about civil resistance and try to build skills of activists on the ground, um, but also through TV channels as well. This is his YouTube channel, and this is where he posts his 10-minute videos. Next. 
diaspora. This is probably one of the best known diasporas, and um, this is the Dalai Lama, who is, uh, who is uh, very much widely viewed as the leader of the movement. And um, so what I'd like to point out about the Tibetan diaspora um, is, uh, more broadly, is um, there is this notion of transformative resistance, um, which is uh, a notion that I came across in working with um, Tendor Dorji, um, who is a very well-known actor in the uh, in the diaspora, um, fighting for um, for Tibetan freedom, and um, he uh, he spoke of. I also spoke with uh, uh, one of our previous awardees, uh, Ladon Tethong, who's another um, prominent actor. And um, they, they spoke of a lot of activities engaging really in um, sharing information, um, engaging in uh, sharing research, um, and building skills of uh, people on the ground in Tibet, which is extremely hard considering the, uh, the limitations in terms of technology and communications. Um, one thing, just one thing I want to point out about them, uh, about uh, my conversation with uh, Ladon is that um, she mentioned a very rec a recurring challenge that I heard in many other um, many other conversations as well, which is um, which is basically that um, that now that they have so much visibility, people think that they don't need any more help and that they don't need any more support or they don't need to grow in terms of participation. It's just too much overload. We've heard about free Tibet, free Tibet, free Tibet. So they actually, um, they actually do struggle to get funding, to get support, because it's just been, they, uh, they're just so incredibly visible, kind of overexposed. All right, okay. let's move on to uh, the killer now. Thanks, Sam. The uh, diaspora is, is me, actually. Mm -hmm. Somebody who, who has just left this country and lives somewhere else. Uh, well, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Bekele, and I live in Britain, and work as a community organizer, especially organizing the African diaspora. So uh, it's, 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 just in my, it's just in my blood. Uh, here I'm going to share about the Ethiopian diaspora. Why Ethiopians actually started leaving Ethiopia. Yeah. It just happened about you know, 40 years ago when we had a revolution in Ethiopia, as you may know. We used to have somebody called Haile Selassie. Many people would know Haile Selassie. And when he was overthrown, when he was overthrown, you know, uh, many people had to leave Ethiopia because those who took power from Haile Selassie were military dictatorship, as you would know. And the only option this folks had to go uh, had to have was to go either to Kenya or Sudan, and then they were mostly brought to, to the states, mostly in, to, to the states. But we have got many Ethiopians. We've got many Ethiopians. Come on in. But we've got many Ethiopians, you know, uh, almost everywhere: Israel, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, Australia, UK and many other countries in, in, in Europe. But United States of America is where we've got about one million. Sure. Uh, yes. So there are around 400,000 Ethiopians in Washington, D.C. and the metropolitan area. Uh, they say that the, uh, Washington, D.C. is the second city with more talk. To uh, exactly. And then Amharic, our language is one of the official languages in, in Washington, D.C. So we've got the largest concentration of Ethiopians in, uh, in Washington, D.C. and the metropolitan area. And, uh, but there's one important question. Ethiopians never wanted to go out of Ethiopia in the past. You know, we loved our country, we used to be there. Many people loved Ethiopia. And I'm going to actually read a story, a quote for you from one of the greatest men of this world, that's Nelson Mandela. Mandela to me about Ethiopia. In his book, you know, anybody who has read the, the Long Journey? Long Walk to Freedom. Long Walk, long walk to Freedom. Mm -hmm. yes, in that book, he, he mentions Ethiopia. He says, Ethiopia always has a special place in my imagination and the prospect of visiting. Ethiopia attracted me more strongly than a trip to France, England, and America combined. I felt I would be visiting my own genesis, unearthing the roots of what made me 
an African. That's what Mandela used to say, that's what he even wrote and testified. So Ethiopians never wanted to go abroad, but situations changed. In the past many years, Ethiopians have actually been flocking. And why? Why? Because economic and political reasons, which I'm going to mention a bit later. The Ethiopian diaspora as actors of movement and as external actors. So we, are, we actually, the diaspora, Ethiopian diaspora, especially in America, Western Europe and South Africa, are extremely strong, strong and powerful. And they act direct and they actually support as well. So one of the, one of the stuff we have, to, we have got is what's called the Ethiopian Satellite TV, which is a very strong media outlet, which, well, I, I was a board member until, until last year. And then we've got lots of media outlets, web-based media outlets, based especially in Europe and, and America, and of course South Africa again. And the other thing we do is actually fundraising, because, you know, the diaspora has got money. Well, I, I, I can contribute a bit, to be honest, uh, compared to the folks back home. So how can we help them? You know, how can we help civil societies back home fighting on the ground? So one of the things we do is raise, uh, raise money, you know, uh, so we, we organize par uh, parties and help them, you know. 1,000 pounds means 33,000 Ethiopian, but in Ethiopia, it means a lot for them. And it could be, it could be a tiny, you know. We always say every little helps. So this role of uh, the Ethiopian diaspora is equally important, that's what I wanted to say. Now I'm going to show you. know, uh, some of you might know his name, Abel Bagelam. FSIs, do you, you know him? Yeah. Yes, he, it was him actually who has been asking me to come here. And then I'm going to share a short video Abel Bagelam acting on Zenalpa. <laughs> So this is one of the media outlets, you know, it is, it's been seen by more than a million people as you, could, as you can see, but it is him, you know, so we organized it in such a way that we got invited, and we organized it in such a way that we have put the media there ready, because we should air it immediately. So uh, that's one of the things I've never had to do, and don't be fooled, the one next please. Another one is interesting because, you know, uh, when you don't get attention from these big figures... The future is there for us to seize. Yes. Yeah. But we've got we to seize it. And if, and if we do, then I guarantee you... Hold on. I, I agree with you all. Why don't I talk about it later? Because I'm just about to finish. You and me, we'll talk about it. All right, I'm going to be coming around. There you go. I agree with you. I want to hear from you. I love you back. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> because Abebe, you know, actually smuggled himself on many occasions. In mm -hmm. one, one, one moment he was in Tanzania. And in Tanzania, you know, in being invited by, by what's called the World Economic Forum. Oh. And you know, I was invited as well by Zen. But I would always be cautious because when you are in Africa, if it's South Africa, we don't care because you are safe from further down. But Kenya, <laughs> come on. You know, you know what, what's going to happen. So what we normally do is 
ask ourselves, we, we just invite ourselves to say, can you invite us? I've now asked you to be here on September 19th. So what is already? Mm -hmm. Time is going. So the next page, please. So why do we actually engage? You know, why do we engage in the astro activities? The first important thing is we've got, you know, we have a link, <coughs> we have a link to our own countries. And the other bit is we've got political interest. We, I want to see change. I want the government to go. If it doesn't go, I cannot go home. That's a problem. So I want them to go. The other bit is economic interest. Some people are interested economically. And when we say the workers, I mean diaspora, it's not necessarily the ones who are opposing. They are also those who are in favor of the government. They have got economic interest as well. Expect this. Time is right. So what do we have? This applies for everybody anyway. Because anybody who says he is a diaspora applies for them. They actually want to see a strong country, as far as we are concerned, we want to see a strong Ethiopia. And we want to see a prosperous Ethiopia. And we want to see democratic Ethiopia. We have never seen democracy in Ethiopia. And I'm really, you know, I'm really scared. My mom would go without seeing democracy. My dad has already gone without seeing me. So it just, just scares me for that matter. And the other bit is to tolerance, you know? Despite all the crisis Mandela faced, despite the 28 years he spent in prison, he was still tolerant. And it's a big, it's a big example. So, because we have always gone you know, under this, what's called, ambitious of violence, we must find ways <coughs> so that we can tolerate one another, so that we don't repeat it. Factors influencing it. One is pol uh, political as uh, association. Some of us actually belong to associations or who have affiliations, uh, either regional or national for that matter. And the other bit is economic interest. And some of us might have built house in Ethiopia, so we say, no, whatever happens in Ethiopia, we don't care. And in reality, some of us belong to a political party, a religion, because Ethiopia is actually orthodox dominated country for that matter. So you've got that reality, but you've got the Muslim brothers as well, as well in reality as well. And self-interest and ego, some people really love it because, you know, they have got some relationship. Relationship with that, and then others is actual access to power because you know they, that's the way. Sometimes you know, he has got access to power. To man, what's his name? Obama, for that matter. That's one of the bits. Next slide, please. So uh, this is actually what we normally say. I'm a second and anything you want, you can actually email me, or you can always follow that on Twitter. And any question you have, I will answer. <laughs> All right, my name is Daniel Tribageni from Uganda, currently living uh, in the United States. I have been here for five months now, uh, and one of the kind of activities I'm, go I'm doing here is to mobilize uh, Ugandan diasporas here in, in America. Actually, we have a lot of Ugandans based here in Boston. There's a very big community here. And on, on Tuesday, on, on Sunday, I'll be speaking on radio station they own in, in, in Boston here about the situation back home. So I work with Solidarity Uganda. Uh, Solidarity Uganda, we engage in um, uh, some of the activities we engage in. Uh, we build, uh, we, we build a movement, and we have a movement called New Uganda. This movement is based on nonviolent action cause structural change in our communities and they're also taking care of the environment. The values of our organization, um, justice and peace, uh, nonviolence, accessibility of, to resources, access to resources, the power of you and me, that's what we, we believe in, and smart change, and also solidarity and dignity of our people. Next, I think we have seen the definition of uh, uh, the diaspora. I think I'm not going to dwell so much on that. We have so many Ugandan, uh, Ugandans living in different countries throughout the world. But this started way back, yeah, even before independence, when we started having Ugandans uh, to, uh, going outside Uganda, uh, Uganda to go and uh, get education in different parts, in the US, UK, and other parts of the world. Well, what, what are this, uh, some of the factors that, um, uh, that influenced that? First of all, uh, we say green pastures. We have so many Ugandans who left home.
coming to look for jobs, opportunities in other, uh, in other countries like United States, UK, Norway, and national, <coughs> and also freedom and justice. Like they left their country because uh, there was no uh, freedom. There was no freedom of speech, there was no justice. Others left the country because of uh, such factors to come and find, uh, to go and find free country where they can have freedom and where they can access justice. And also others came, uh, with, oh, I talked about this like, in the first war, uh, they, uh, uh, they wanted to, to go and uh, have educational uh, knowledge to, to, get, to, get, to go back to school, have masters, have degrees. So that's why we have so many also students in different countries uh, of the world. Then there are family ties, yeah, family ties. People uh, are here because, there are some, some, some people are here because they have families here, you know. They are married, you know, these uh, in, interracial marriages. So others are here for that. No. And also we have um, foreign government policies like, yeah, that can be entertained with green, uh, green pasture looking for jobs. Like, uh, we have green card holders in this country. People apply for green card and they are, let's go to another country. So those are some of the factors and also dictatorial tendencies in Uganda that we have also can be entertained with uh, freedom and justice. Ugandan key activities, uh, activities that are the involved in, uh, we have uh, holding the demonstrations against repression back home. Ugandans are, are good at that. When something happens, like for example, uh, the arrest of the key opposition leader, Kiza Lesi was arrested. We, we saw so many Ugandans across the world, US, UK, and other parts, uh, coming to, going to Ugandan embassies, demonstrating, saying you release Kiza Lesi, release Kiza Lesi. And also, we, we see the same thing happening in um, uh, when, when, they arrested, when they presented the bill in parliament and eventually the president had to consent it against, uh, to criminalize homosexuals, the homosexuality bill, I don't know whether you heard about that, because it was all over. Mm -hmm. So the president consented on it and said homosexuals will be criminalized, they will be put in jail if they, if they are found out to be gay or lesbians, they will be punished. Yeah. So we saw that. Next, no, I think we can see some pictures. Next, yeah, we seven uh, raping Uganda. Next, so that's when he, he consented the bill. He said he came and said, "Let me show the entire world and the U.S. especially that we have um, uh, we have power." He we have power, so he consented the deal, which it has, it has never happened. This was the first time Museven did this on camera. I invited international media and signed the, the, the bill into an act so that people could, do, could see that. Yeah, yeah, I'm too gay, I can't speak straight. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. so <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, this was back home, also back home, uh, in, uh, yeah, people demonstrated against that. Oh. Okay, then the yeah, next, uh, another activity that uh, the people engage in here, the Ghana diaspora, they engage in two fundraising for political mobilization back home. I remember the first time I came here, I was, uh, I was talking to my friend, is uh, a major he was a, a, a colonel who left the country, who deserted the military, and is living in Norway. So he contacted me, says, please, can we, can you mobilize some funding for political action back home? So we had to contribute money for that. 
but though it was on the partisan line, of which I did not believe because I was part of the process and all that, but I said, okay, for, for this, let me just contribute something. Yeah. Uh, and also writing petitions. Yeah. They write petition, go to White House, present these petitions to the international community here when they are here. You know, to see, uh, to engage with the international community, to tell them to do something about the, uh, the situation back home. And also engaging on, on social publics, you know, like social media, yeah? Twitter, Facebook, they are very active on that. They are very active on that. Uh, yeah, radio talk shows, conferences and symposiums. <coughs> uh, every year there are conferences and symposiums here <laughs> in, 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 in the US and other parts of the country where Ugandan communities will come and talk about issues back home. Religious sermons, they go in churches, they talk about things that are happening. Yeah. Research and documentation. We have scholars here, they come home, they get some information, they document the things, especially students who are living here. So they go, they collect the data and that. Next. What is driving the Ugandan diaspora in uh, civil resistance? Culture. It's very important. Ugandan culture. Their culture. Because that's, that's where they belong. That's where uh, they got the culture from. So they are, they, are, they are really attached to that kind of culture. Then the people, they have, they have, they have families there. The people, they, they have friends. You know? Those people, when they are here and they hear someone has done something to their friends, they'll feel that. That then homeland, of course, human rights, freedom and democracy, rule of law, dignity, opportunity, and fair, uh, fairness for all. All these things. And when we talk about opportunity, for example, there are so many interests people have invested back home. They have invested their money back home, so it's very important. Okay. Yeah, sources of information for civil resistance and engagement. Yeah. How do you tell people that this, uh, we, we need to get engaged in this kind of work? One-on-one -on -one or word of mouth, contact, you talk to a friend, or also we talk to a friend. Online Ugandan newspapers, we have can easily access that to know what is happening back home. And international mini houses, that's how we get the information. That's how we get information. Then, then, uh, opportunities for civil resistance in diaspora. There's a lot of opportunities here uh, in diaspora compared to our countries because this, the space is limited back home. So here there is freedom of expression for information sharing, you know, access to international and foreign support. People here can easily connect with international uh, people uh, from other countries to, to, to have to have that ability to amplify their voices. Then strong foreign network and gaining privilege over people who are, for example, people who are at home. So all these networks are very important. Accessibility to resources, yeah. There are resources here compared to get, getting resources back home. People here, organization can give you money. But back home, businesses, they cannot give you money because they fear. If we give you money and the government gets to know that, they'll, they'll destroy our businesses. So here there is that kind of freedom. The business, the corporation can always give you money. Mm -hmm. Challenges. Challenges for organizing in diaspora. Limited time. People here, he, it's, <laughs> I was talking with her that life here is about go, 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 go. Huh? You have to go work. Pay bills, work, pay bills, go work, pay bills. So it's very difficult to. <laughs> we, I, I'm, we, I'm trying to set up a meeting in, in Washington in October, uh, October or November. But people are like, I was to look at my schedule, but I know I, I, I have a passion. I know they have a passion for that, but sometimes it's very difficult. So limited time. And also this unit, you know. You, uh, you, you, uh, in Uganda here, there. I think uh, we, we we jumped one slide about the categorization of uh, 
Yeah, but but I okay. Yeah, this unit, you, uh, Ugandan government spends a lot of money to, uh, to bringing spies here. There are so many spies, even here in Boston, who are paid, and across the world, who are paid, who are on yeah, government payroll. Their role is to do that, to monitor. Mm -hmm. Who's saying what? You know? So all this, you know, uh, it makes you uh, uh, people not united in our way. Uh, and it brings fear to engage. Sometimes if they know you are opposing the government, they'll attack your family. Mm -hmm. You know? That's how people don't want sometimes to engage. They can give you money separately, but they don't want to come out openly. Yeah. And also partisanship, whereby people will know. For me, I'm supporting this political party. I'm supporting this political party. Ugandans will like so much in work, uh, our direction is so much attached to political parties if we, are, we want to support like civil uh, resistance. So these are some of the challenges that we are, we are having and we'll have to deal with. Sounds like yeah. challenges that movements themselves yeah. actually yeah. Think yes. have as well. Yeah. So conclusion and way forward. Organization, organization, organization. We need to do that. Okay. And that's the reason I'm here. We want to organize Ugandan diaspora. I know it will take time, but we need to do that. I know there is a force with the diaspora because there is power in that. One, one example, <laughs> one example that I, I don't shut up. Uh, <laughs> the example I, I gave you uh, initially about the gay people or homosexual people demonstrating around the world against the, that act. What that act produced was all these foreign governments U.S., Norway, Netherlands, all missionaries. They came together and they started withdrawing the money from, from the government. What did the, uh, the, the government do? President said, say, no, 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 no. He, he, even, he, he, he told the judges because people, uh, the gay people appealed to court. When they went to court, he said, judges, you, 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 don't, you don't go back to that. Let, let it be retracted. The bill, uh, the, the act was retracted. And people wanted to push it back. He told them, no, 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 don't play with that. You're playing on fire. Don't. Because people lost jobs. The economy was coming down. That's why I realized that this is a force. So, I'm, diaspora, they have a force if they are united. If we are united, we can cause very big change in our communities. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Okay, so, we for the last uh, 15 to 20 minutes, we are going to just have an informal discussion about the questions that you um, put down. Um, I want to say something. Yeah, sure, go for it. Uh, Venezuela, historically, was an immigrant country people from Europe, from the Americas, from Africa, from, from Asia. Uh, we are multi-ethnic. But now, since 1999, we are living our first and diaspora. A million Venezuelans have gone of, of the country because of the political situation, economical situation, the crisis. And then now we have Venezuelans over the world and they try to organize uh, many collective rallies. Uh, there are some NGOs and we are trying to engage these, these people, these Venezuelans around the world, the diaspora, uh, to the initiative that we have in, in our country, uh, in, in my country. Uh, I'm working with All for Freedom and there is a, a, a project uh, that is called uh, Rescue Venezuela that is collecting medicines from, from in, in different countries of the world to, to get them to, to the country, uh, to Venezuela, for uh, hospitals and medical centers. 
So I think this, this is a, a new challenge that the, the Venezuelan people we are, that we are facing, and it is important, so important to to learn about other stories. Yeah, that's great. So you're on the other side. You're in mm -hmm. the origin country, yes. reaching out to diaspora. Yes. Yeah, it's great to have your point of view. Um, oh. I think the first question that we can engage on, if if you would like, is um, how is diaspora viewed in the home country, in the origin country? This is a great question, I think, because it speaks to the challenges and opportunities that diasporas have. Um, does anyone have any answers to how diasporas are viewed in origin countries, whether you are living in the origin country or you are a part of the diaspora? Yes. Mm -hmm. In my case, for example, we are seen by our uh, by the regime as a a spy, a searcher, but also by paid, a person who is paid by U.S., by European, to uh, to make the uh, the country down and to make uh, trouble in the country. This is what they see, and they see also. As we said we are collecting money everywhere for our own uses. This is always a, a problem for us. Uh, it's very, very difficult to prove that we don't get money, <laughs> that we are not paid. Mm -hmm. um, but this is what one side. But from our own um, activists, some of them think, uh, which are not very well informed, they believe also uh, we can help them to get out, to come here, to have, uh, to get out on the countries, but also they always think we can always send money. Money is somewhere here on the road and we can collect it and send it to them. This is a big problem for us, um, which we are facing on, on both sides, on our friends, but also on, on the regime sides. Pressure to send money, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is anyone else saying that? Oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, actually, we don't think the, the money is an issue. The, the diaspora, uh, that there is a, a study of the World Bank that states that uh, it represents $53 billion a year. So it's the first source of aid. I mean, it's more than uh, you know, the, the overseas development aid, more than what the European Union, which is the, the first, um, the first uh, source of development aid in the world. So um, I would say that in our work, uh, because we work with, um, uh, with diaspora organizations in France and in Europe, uh, there is an, uh, an ambivalent, um, how to say that, uh, an ambivalent, um, um, how to say that, <laughs> um, sorry. <laughs> Just to say it in French? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm just a bit tired. <laughs> um, it's, it's ambivalent, mm -hmm. let's say, let's put it uh, this way. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the diaspora uh, are seen, uh, the diasporas of, um, are seen as uh, great actors because they provide a financial uh, means. But at the same time, when uh, those people, they want to get back home uh, and be part of the political um, um, environment, they are uh, like, uh, they threaten the, the, the local people because... Yeah, not welcome. <laughs> yeah, and it's really ambivalent and very interesting to analyze and uh, how we can make them participate either in the country of origin or in the, 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 the country uh, they, um, in the country they, uh, that, that will come. Yeah, and I would say it's really difficult question yeah. to answer. Yeah, that's all part of the migration story. What I call the migration story is that ambivalence. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think the, it's very difficult to have a, a complete uh, a, um, one narrative on how they are viewed. But in my country, uh, w during the hyperinflationary era, up to 2008, the diaspora literally sustained the economy. They remitted money which served the families and yeah. the government itself. Then after 2008, when the economy became dollarized, the remittances from the diaspora were no longer very effective in that like during the hyperinflationary era, you could change 100 pounds mm -hmm. and get billions or trillions <laughs> of Zimbabwean dollars. 
I know of people who bought houses from about 300 pounds. They converted it and they bought a very good mansion out of that. <coughs> so now, the local population appears to have adjusted to the situation at home and no longer view the diaspora as the, the way they viewed them before 2008. There is also that feeling that they abandoned us when we needed them most. We are fighting alone in the trenches and when we finally overthrow Mugabe, they want to come and take advantage, you know. Yeah, so, but there is also some of us who believe the diaspora, um, they are exposed to good governance mm. in, in the countries where they are. Yeah. And when the time for reconstruction comes, we need such people in government, in the public sector, in the private sector, to help to rebuild the country. Are there um, are there efforts right now of of people who are sort of coming together in the diaspora and saying, you know, maybe thinking of going back and helping to staff? Uh, different uh, institutions and things like that, like actually getting organized from now for that moment? Yeah, yeah. wherever they went, they came up with committees mm -hmm. and they regularly meet to, to discuss. Government itself also is now reaching out to the diaspora to say, mm -hmm. can you help us? But yeah. they want, the problem is they only want money from them. <laughs> yeah, but the, that discussion of the role they can play in the future of the country, it's, it's everywhere, both in the diaspora and at home. So the next question. Should I yeah, one more comment. <coughs> Actually, good. The yeah. question was mine. Uh, yeah. Because yeah. I, you know, I really want to see how diaspora actually view it elsewhere. And, you know, for me, I live in, uh, in the United Kingdom. I think I would be just living there forever. But I want to go to Ethiopia and help, or I want to go somewhere somewhere Africa and help, because we put, as you say, Paul, we put lots of exposure, lots. We, we learn a lot on a, on a daily basis. So as far as we are concerned, the Ethiopians are concerned, we kind of organize ourselves up and down, we're almost all over the world, and prepare ourselves so that if there is a change, we can just step in and help and come out, because by the end of the day, the, the transition. The transition is really important, yeah. and someone exposed to that, you know, someone exposed to democracy, to the way, uh, to the way how democracy works is yeah. really needed. And, and but at the same time, there's always suspicion back home, you know. They say, okay, they want our money. They want, they really desperate, desperately need our money. But at the same time, okay, he wants to come and take power. It's not only about power, about helping that country, you know, during the transition. Interesting. So they're basically milking cows. <laughs> so in some ways, sure. One more comment, and then we'll go to the next question. I want to make sure to get um, to as many questions as possible, just to be fair. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I was interested in, in this group not because I'm a diaspora, but uh, I've done many work in South Africa as an activist, including coordinating the anti xenophobia campaign mm -hmm. from 2007 until 2008. Mm -hmm. Um, the, 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 you see, in, in South Africa, we are having uh, too many, too many, too many uh, diaspora. Um, and then the, the real problem is that when, when poor people, uh, in many cases, when they are uh, protest the immigrants a lot, particular the immigrants from Ethiopia and Somalia. So, you know, People will be protesting against government, but the protest ended up maybe with looting of the shops of the Somali or the Ethiopians, and then that creates a problem. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe, maybe for me, the real question that we may try to, to answer, how do we reconcile? Because these are the effects uh, of colonialism. Mm -hmm. And then as Africans now, we don't see each other as uh, Africans. We tend to focus on the borders that are created there. And we never created these borders. These borders were created by the colonialists. But people, you know, even in, in, in South Africa, the other Ndebele is in Zimbabwe, the other Ndebele is in South Africa. 
like in Swaziland, the other Swazis are the, the, the citizens of uh, South Africa, the others are, uh, you know, Swaziland. So now I, was, I, I wanted to look at the ways of saving the, 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 the diasporas in, in, in South Africa because it, 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 some people are, are crying because the small business that we are saying we want to give it up, they are also having a program of inciting this violence. Because what we do is that there, there are developments of malls now and the malls are destroying the, the spaza shop. So these spaza shops are getting uh, hired to Somalis and Ethiopians. Okay, people will make a living out of getting the, 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 the rents from, from, from Somalis and Ethiopians. But if there is a, a resistance, a service delivery protest against the government, they are forced to close their shops. If they didn't hear that, then they become, you know, a victim. Because people, you know, I don't know what, where does this thing come from when poor people are subjected to, to, to a stress instead of uh, taking their anger back to the people who are stressing them. They are taking that anger to the poorest. Mm -hmm. And the poorest in South Africa will be diaspora. And then they will attack them left and right. You look at the struggle of the farm workers. Mm -hmm. When farm workers were receiving uh, exploitation from the, the, the farm owners, they took the struggle against the, 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 the farm bosses. But in the end, you know, they ended up attacking the workers who were migrant workers from Zimbabwe, Lesotho, you know. And now there is this uh, say in South Africa, yes, immigrants are coming here to South Africa to steal our job, to steal our wives. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is that, you know, <laughs> Africans are Africans. They will love each other one way or the other. You will find our sisters getting married to Zimbabweans or Nigerians or what. But some people are focusing that those are poor. And once there is a protest, they must hide themselves because that anger is going to spill to them. So now I was like concerned as to how do we avoid these things when we are in our resistance or civil resistance. Why do we have to take our anger to these people? When he is, when I was... When, I said like it's the dynamic of power. Yeah. The dynamics of the yeah. So it sounds like you're kind of from the origin country, viewing the diaspora as it's very problematic, not only ambivalent but also problematic in the sense that diasporas can be um, can often uh, create noise that just doesn't help, which is something that I've heard actually also from a Cameroonian diaspora organization. And yeah, um, was, we only have two minutes left, by okay, the way. Okay, so okay. I don't want to cut you off, but I wanted okay. to get to at least one last question because um, we only. Well, we will only have gotten to two questions. Um, it's diaspora and the construction of identity. I guess it's not a question, but whoever wrote that question, if you'd like to... I yeah. that so what would your question be about that? Uh, about... And the, thank you, Michael. Uh, the people around the world from a different foreign country, uh, they are not part of their... Well, they are part of their country, but they are not living there, mm -hmm. and they are... Uh, with a new culture like the, the Ethiopians in Washington DC uh, or the Venezuelans in, in Europe uh, and they are a mixture. Mm -hmm. So what that so how do diasporas yes. construct identity or yes. how do they influence the construction of an identity and, of a nation? And don't be in a ghetto. But also being being international but maintain the culture. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Anyone have any comments on that? So it's like balancing the two, or so what we normally try to do is number one, we encourage Ethiopians, wherever they are, to maintain their identities, cultures, whatever it is, and they have actually brought all the way from to the countries where they are. But at the same time, we encourage them to engage in local democracy. It's really important that you know you mm -hmm. kind of own the country you, you are in. You know, I was just sending a message to folks in the United Kingdom earlier, say, "Have you voted?" Because it's, there's an election today, right. and if they if they don't vote, they would suffer. So it's important to take you know to have the balance right. When you are in, think about your home country and your contract for that, I, as I mentioned, 
I really want to go to work and help Africa, for that matter. Not only Ethiopia. I don't care because for me, the whole of Africa is my home. That's how I see it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but at the same time, you must engage lo in local democracy. You know, Ethiopians mm -hmm. in Virginia, Washington, and you know, the metropolitan area could actually change uh, what they call the, could sway the vote. It's because it's massive. Mm -hmm. So that's what's important. Maintain it, but at the same time, engage. One last comment, I think, from Fai, who wanted to speak, and then unfortunately we have to cut it off because we you. have already no more time. It's just a question ahead, uh, yeah. um, to the two gentlemen. Normally, when you move from a, a very troubled region to a country that is relatively safer, you also face resistance there. How have you been treated? Uh, both in Britain and in the United States by the local community. Yeah, uh, let me let me go first. Uh, first of all, uh, before coming here, I've been I I I have been involved in with engaging with diasporas here before coming here. And when I came here, I kept doing activities back home, so that because there is no way I, I could stay here without communicating back home. It's about communication and because of these social networks now we have um, uh, Twitter, Facebook, WhatsApp, you constantly engage. Though at one point someone asked me, and this, is from, this one was from the ruling government, say, why did you leave the country? Why, 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 why are you there? You come back here. They don't want you to leave because they know you are, go you are going to spoil the image. I think you misunderstood yeah. me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I'm, talking I'm, about I'm talking about here in the United States. Oh, here in the United States. Yeah. 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 And yeah. integration. How, are you, How are you built here? Yeah. 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 Shall I step in the cover? Which one? Shall I step in the cover? <laughs> yeah, it's so it's yeah, 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 but yeah, yeah. Yeah. You each have yeah. 30 seconds yeah. and then we have to run yeah. to the next session. There's yeah. actually no yeah. break, so yeah. you get 30 so seconds. So the way I is, you know, when I actually arrived in Britain, you know, the first thing I had to do is to credential myself because you know I used to work in American Embassy in Ethiopia. I used to work in USAID for the Sheraton. I was a manager, you see. Then I, so the only thing I had to do was first of all to credential myself, but at the same time keep fighting. Because you know, when, if I compare myself to many African colleagues in the, in the United Kingdom, I probably get twice they get because I fought. So, so there is going to be resistance, but you have, you have to fight, you know. There will always be resistance, whether you like it or not. You will be hammered on social media. Take it easy, keep on fighting. But um, mostly, I'm having also the same experience, yeah. mostly you are very welcome in the community here, okay. and you are very well supported. And if they know you are engaged in uh, business or okay. in activities in your countries, they really uh, appreciate that, oh. and so mostly they are very positive. Thank Great. You. I would Thank you. really like to continue this conversation, and we should. Mm. Yeah. However, now is the next uh, <laughs> the next uh, breakout session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.